Welcome everybody. Uh, we are going to do our workshop today on academic integrity and in online courses. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Sarah Holt. I'm an instructional designer at the Office of Distance Education and E-Learning. I'll be one of your facilitators today. And I'll have my colleagues introduce themselves. And I'm Charles Williamson. Uh, I'm also, uh, I'm an instructional designer in the Office of Distance Education and E-Learning, and I'll also be uh, a, facil uh, a facilitator today. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Young. I'm part of the Carmen uh, team. Uh, I work for OD supporting uh, the OSU tool set. We also have our colleague, uh, Queenie Chow. She's a consultant at OD as well, and she'll be um, helping us in the chat. So um, during this workshop, we are gonna keep everybody muted. We have um, places built in to reflect. We'll put you in breakout rooms in a little bit and we'll encourage you to unmute and talk to each other at that time. But while we're together in this main room, we're gonna encourage you to use that chat space in Zoom as a place to ask questions or share experiences about um, things that might come up, things you're doing that work in the chat. And Queenie will be there to answer questions and share links for the kinds of resources that we reference throughout the session. So if you notice in the chat, Queenie has already shared with us the slides for this session as well as the OD workshops playlist. So this is going to be recorded. You can watch it later. Um, if you miss something, if your internet gets glitchy or you um, wanna see some of the resources shared again, but we will also encourage you to download those slides and to capture the chat before you log out at the end of our session so that you can have all of those links and those resources saved for yourself. So as we get started, we'd like you to use the chat to share a little bit with us about what motivated you to join us today. It's Monday, um, it's cold, it's still very windy at my house. I don't know where you're located. What is, have, what is motivating you to spend your Monday afternoon in a session on academic integrity and online courses? And if you can just go ahead and share your reasons in the chat right now. Credit, okay. Not sure what that means, but uh, Jen, if you wanna tell us a little bit more about that, I'd love to hear it. Uh, teaching online next semester, getting ready. It's a big concern for some of you right now. Um, looks like a lot of folks teaching next semester, thinking ahead, needing to think differently about things. Uh, yeah, a really large, Bonnie's got a really large course with several hundred students. So thinking about how to mitigate um, misconduct. And it sounds like a lot of you are really interested in, in how things might be changing during COVID or as you're moving online um, and just feeling like this is a current pressing issue. So hopefully um, this will address some of those, uh, that need for those big picture tips, some of those best practices. Um, we are probably not going to solve all of your concerns in our 90 minute session, but we will also share resources with you at the end for um, where to go if you end up needing to really personalize the best practices that we come up with today. So in this 90 minute session, we're gonna help you define academic integrity in the online environment and discuss those current challenges you're already surfacing in your concerns today. Um, we're also gonna think about what parts of your course can be modified to decrease the likelihood of cheating and help you make informed choices about how to increase integrity. So kind of decreasing misconduct, increasing integrity. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we'll end with resources for next steps, how to take these broad best practices and apply them specifically to your course. We're gonna structure our time like this. We're going to spend a little bit of time um, thinking about why students cheat so that we can understand why this is happening in general. And then we're going to talk through an integrated approach to approaching academic misconduct. So we're going to talk about prevention, and then we will talk about um, some of the tools that we have um, at Ohio State to mitigate the misconduct. Um, we will also have planning and reflection throughout but specifically some time at the end for how this might apply to your specific courses, and then we'll share those resources. So we wanna start with um, thinking about 
your experience with misconduct. So if you have taught in the past, if you're teaching right now, um, then you probably have some stories or some things that are concerns that are pressing for you. Um, and if you have not yet taught online, maybe think about just what your general impressions are um, or how you think this might be happening in other people's classes. And I'm gonna give you a minute to just think about this and how it applies to you personally. And then we're gonna put you in some um, breakout rooms with uh, one or two other people. And I'd like you to unmute, share your camera if you're comfortable uh, doing so, um, and talk about this with your group. So share, what percentage of your students do you think are cheating? And how does that feel to you as the instructor when you realize that it's happening? Um, you will have about five minutes in your breakout room. So I'm just gonna ask you to sort of be teachers with each other and make sure uh, that you're gracious peers and that everybody gets a chance to share. Okay, so you were in your small groups sharing your answers. Um, in the chat, let us know, let's, let's share between the groups there in the chat. What were some things that you had in common as you were reflecting on this experience or what came up that was surprising to you about these reflections? And just for those of us who just joined near the end of that activity, we were reflecting on um, how often we think students are um, cheating and how it feels as the instructor when that happens. So just let us know in the chat what commonalities or surprises did you hear? So some, sometimes we might suspect that there's some cheating taking place, but not take action. 10% or less, that it's a minor problem, maybe a few fairly infrequent, 5%, 10%. Deciding when to ask, to act if you suspect something versus that like totally flagrant cheating. Yeah. So I think this is um, pretty, pretty similar to what we heard the last time we offered this workshop that it's a small percentage, but a lot of times it's just something that we worry about. We have those suspicions or we're not sure, or we're not sure what to do about it. And maybe it feels really important, even if we know it's maybe not happening at a widespread scale for most of us. Okay, so Charles is going to um, dig into this a little bit more about those feelings and how big it might feel to us as instructors versus what we actually know about students and cheating. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, I just wanted to briefly go over some of the reasons why students cheat, and this is kind of cold from a lot of research. Um, in general, though, um, if you take anything away from this meeting, I want us to kind of dispel this long-standing myth of the mendacious student, that cheating occurs due to acts of uh, malice and uh, <laughs> uh, active uh, flagrance of your academic intent and integrity standards but rather they come from a variety of different factors, some that are called, or some that are kind of um, centered around the global health crisis that we find ourselves in right now. And others just from, you know, a variety of other uh, contingencies that are beyond our control and beyond the control of our students. Um, one of the main reasons um, and one of the most, um, immediate things that we can kind of recognize as a source of student anxiety and uh, something that might prompt a student to cheat uh, are high stakes assessments. Generally, when we're developing our courses and developing our assignments, we can kind of find um, a direct correlation between high stakes assessments and a uh, student's inclination to cheat. The higher the stakes, the more likely a student is to kind of circumvent or feel anxiety around that particular uh, exam and try to, um, you know, uh, tobble the system if, as it were. So uh, when we're developing there are assignments and we're gonna kind of talk about alternatives to those high stakes assessments. But whenever you're kind of putting all of your, um, whenever you have these sorts of 
high point percentages attached to these assignments that could potential could could potentially spell a certain uh, a student's doom in terms of whether they pass or fail in your course and you put that all on one or two major assignments students are more inclined to, to cheat in those particular instances we also can just kind of chalk it up to uncertain expectations for success uh, we have this presumption that our academic integrity standards are you know uh, that students have a very intuitive understanding of american academic integrity standards and that's certainly not the case especially whenever you stop Thinking, thinking about our student body as a sort of monolith, um, you know, especially, you know, cross culturally, the standards of academic integrity vary quite drastically whenever you're kind of looking at it from a cross cultural prism. Uh, we also have things like access and equity, uh, and this is something that affects, you know, certain students more than others, especially students who might be uh, non-native and taking our courses from another country or uh, students who are from an economically disadvantaged background or students who are in more rural areas where access to certain things that we take for granted like technology, Wi-Fi, or the student resources that students typically had access to whenever they were on campus. If they're off campus, you know, that is closed off to them. That is, a, that is something that they no longer have access to which can again um, prompt a student to try to game the system as it were. We also have, you know, very basic things like panic and stress, uh, <laughs> right? And this, this stems from things like um, technology, illness, family, housing. And again, uh, this is going to affect certain students differently. We need to think about how some of the some students from marginalized student populations might be affected more deeply during a pandemic you know uh, low-income students non-native learners uh, lgbtq students etc um, this is something that affects students in a, my a myriad of ways that we cannot predict or try to nail down. And I think a lot of faculty are kind of recognizing that as we move forward, they're getting inundated with emails from students who are kind of um, explaining to their faculty that there are contingencies that are beyond their control. And finally, we have the idea of like centering distrust in a student and uh, instructor relationship. Sometimes, um, you know, sometimes it's very important very early on to build that instructor presence and build that level of trust with your students because sometimes um, distrust can lead to these instances of academic, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the things like uh, plagiarism and cheating. In general, though, um, regardless of the circumstances and the rationale or the reason that a student is cheating, we want to take a more empathetic approach rather than a combative one. So uh, I want us to kind of briefly reflect on what challenges you think students are facing. Uh, and in particular, I want you to answer this second question in the chat. And you can just kind of like type out your answers uh, take a moment to reflect and just type out your answers in the chat. Which one of these areas might be a driving factor for misconduct in your own online courses? And if you're not teaching an online course right now, what do you anticipate as one of the driving factors? And I think, you know, we, we're, I'm reading the chat right now and Muhammad brings up, um, you know, a really excellent point. Um, about kind of taking into consideration um, pressures from the pandemic and you know concerns that they're going to get a low grade, stuff like that. So definitely, uh, Tiffany brings up stress, um, challenges with mental health stressors. You know that's one of those factors that I was mentioning earlier. Like certain students are, um, and I think you know we can kind of also attest to this, that we're all kind of going through our own mental health crises as we're going through this pandemic. And the same is true of your students as well as ourselves. 
Uh, things like stress, lack of time, definitely. Uh, waiting until the last minute and then stressed, especially if you're not used to managing your time with an online learning environment. You know, we kind of, again, assume that uh, time management, um, that all students have an intuitive understanding of how to manage their own time whenever they're kind of working from home um, or, work, or, or, or learning in an online learning environment, that's not always the case. Um, distraction and inability to focus. Um, uh, yeah, being in a course that was not, being in an online course that was not designed to be online, and we definitely we're going to help you with that in just a few moments. Um, yeah, the high stakes assessments. Again, I, I think I'm seeing kind of, a, kind of like echoing some of the concerns that I just mentioned. And sometimes it's not clear what counts as academic misconduct. And again, being as explicit as you can about your own academic integrity standards um, is very important. Time management, of course, yeah. I think, I think, again, not everybody knows how to manage their time within an online learning environment. And tech support, yeah. Like, if you're in an environment where you don't have access to a strong Wi-Fi signal or the software you need to use or the plethora of resources you might have available to you if you are on campus, you are more likely to cheat just because of that lack of equity. So let's go ahead and move on to what we've called an integrated approach. Now, this is an approach that I believe is uh, more preventative rather than punitive when it comes to curbing instances of academic misconduct. And this is a three-pronged approach that hopefully uh, will be able to kind of deter these instances of academic misconduct while also addressing the student's needs and employing best practices. Um, and of course, at the same time, also meeting your course goals and objectives in a more substantive and um, in a more substantive and safe way. So uh, the first of these three uh, suggestions, oh, can we go back, sorry. So the three basic approaches that we have, uh, we want to redesign assessments to make cheating more difficult. Uh, and we're gonna show you some examples of assessments, uh, particularly authentic assessments, where the sort of, um, empirically right or wrong or uh, automated grading that typically leads to these instances of academic misconduct can be curbed or called out altogether. Um, so redesigning assessments is the first thing. And then you want to kind of build your course to prevent cheating. Uh, and that includes things like scaffolding or adding, um, you know, at, changing the settings on certain exams and settings to make cheating more difficult. And then using tools to detect and interpret lapses. And these are tools like uh, Proctorio and Turnitin that uh, we're gonna talk about at the end of this presentation. So when we talk about course redesign, uh, there are certain things that we want to take into consideration when we are redesigning our assessments, redesigning our course, and trying to find ways to curb these instances of academic misconduct. One of the most important is point redistribution. There's a general rule of thumb that we like to employ when we're talking to faculty about developing their assignments for an online learning environment. And that is that a single exam should not wreck your chances of passing or failing a course. Um, these, and again, this is what I was talking about very early on, uh, those high stakes assessments that we see where the majority of the points that you can earn over the course of the semester, are they all hinge on one or two particular assignments. Those are the types of assignments that students are more likely to cheat on. So redistributing the points uh, and spreading it across a variety of different assignments of varying levels of high and low stakes, that's 
one primary way of eliminating these instances of academic misconduct. Sorry, that was my daughter uh, busting into this meeting. <laughs> Uh, there's also the idea of frequent testing, right? Rather than like having things hinge on these uh, monolithic exams, we want to kind of have frequent low stakes testing. And these can come in the form of knowledge checks, portfolios, weekly learning activities, and so on. We also want to uh, scaffold our assignments. We want to create this uh, sequence of mini steps that allow students to work on assignments in a sort of piecemeal, um, well-paced fashion, rather than having them just turn in these giant deliverables all in one chunk. We also want to rewrite our questions to make them um, to kind of add a variety of ways in which students can kind of express what they've learned and demonstrate mastery over the course content and create authentic tasks that mirror more closely the sorts of tasks that students will be asked to do in their own professional lives. Um, so next, what Sarah is gonna kind of showcase, um, this is a course that we believe does a very good job of demonstrating some of the principles of that three-pronged approach um, to course redesign. So this is a course that Sarah Holt had worked on uh, in a previous semester. This is uh, an environmental and natural resources course. Um, and we're gonna see two different versions of the same a sort of before and after portrait of what the course looked like. So this week eight module that you're seeing right now in front of you, um, this is the sort of before as very, you know, it's very clearly labeled old version. Uh, so the old version of this assignment or this module, uh, a lot of the course content and material was the same. However, the ways in which, the way in which uh, student success was being assessed was through this enormous midterm exam, which, you know, as you can kind of highlight it there, was worth 300 big chunky points. Um, so you have this single high stakes exam that is providing students with a number of, you know, multiple choice uh, exam, uh, examination questions on the various places and laws of environmental and natural resources. Uh, it's not exactly an authentic assessment, certainly. It's um, the sort of exam that is very traditional in a face-to-face in a, in a -face course. Uh, and this is the type of assessment that we're trying to um, either eliminate or limit within your online courses. So the old version of this had a single high stakes exam with zero scaffolding. In the redesign, which I think Sarah's gonna scroll down on. In the redesign, what we've done is we've redistributed all of those points, that 300, those 300 points um, are being redistributed over the course of the entire course. So students have frequent uh, knowledge check quizzes. Each week, students take a very low stakes knowledge check quiz. Uh, and again, giving um, one, you know, more frequent opportunities to earn points and to practice what you've learned and to, again, demonstrate mastery of the course content. And that giant midterm exam was replaced with a portfolio assignment where rather than just kind of answering these, you know, empirical yes or no questions, um, that could easily be copied and, and, and shared um, or you know, is very susceptible to academic misconduct. Rather, we've created this portfolio assignment that is spread out and scaffolded over the course of multiple weeks. And again, again, if we can kind of like scroll down, we can see that week seven and eight, students are kind of working on this portfolio assignment. And this is a, an assignment that's 
kind of, I believe, and, and Sarah, you can correct me if I'm wrong, this is something that progresses through the entire semester that students are working on this. And rather than just answering the sort of barrage of question on places and laws, rather you select a single place and examine the laws and apply what you've learned over the course of the semester in a more authentic way. So this is not only uh, an example of a really well scaffolded assignment that is, you know, students are turning in these smaller deliverables each week. Um, that's kind of like a part of this larger portfolio, but they're also engaging in the material in an authentic assessment. There's no single right or wrong answer, and therefore it's much harder for students to cheat. So, you know, in, by changing this, the, the central assessment of the course, um, we're asking students to demonstrate professional skills rather than just regurgitate course material that they've memorized over the course of watching a bunch of lecture videos and um, com completing a bunch of readings. Uh, so we can go back to the slides, Sarah. And Sarah is going to talk more about the actual nuts and bolts of what makes those assignments tick. Okay, so um, I, I think there were a couple of sort of thoughts in the chat and you're welcome to add some more there um, if you have questions about redesign. One thing that um, Bonnie and Stephanie are talking about is, you know, the, there's this tension between we want to give students more opportunities to earn points and scaffold and do this great redesign ideas. And then we also feel like we're hearing from our students that Sometimes that makes it feel like there's a lot of work every week. Um, and I think to Bonnie's point, um, you know, she has done a really good job, it sounds like, of redistributing those points. So we're not just adding more work every week on top of those high stakes exams, but really um, it looks like Bonnie was talking about removing two large midterms and changing the weights or offering opportunities to drop your lowest scores so that that pressure of performing on every single assignment at a perfect um, you know, assessment is, is, is a little bit lessened for her students. Um, so we hear a lot about, it sounds like some of you are teaching next semester. And so you have now still several weeks to really think about doing radically different things if you wanted to make a, a authentic assessment or split a large high stakes exam into smaller pieces throughout the term. But for those of you who are teaching right now or maybe don't have as much freedom to redesign those assessments in some of those larger ways, I wanted to just draw your attention to some of those smaller things like Bonnie was mentioning um, that that Charles was emphasizing is, you know, just tweaking that exam, keeping the same questions and breaking it up or um, offering to drop the lowest scores. Some of those things can go a long way, even if you can't add a completely different assessment at this point. So if you have more questions, feel free to drop them in there. It looks like um, Tiffany is interested in but in, impacted about how it might impact your prep and grading time. That's a pretty common concern. Charles, do you have any um, anything you wanted to support Tiffany with in that concern or others who are worried about grading time for authentic assessments? Yeah, uh, in general, um, the assignments themselves don't have to be tremendous. In fact, with the scaffolding that we're employing, where they're not turning in these giant deliverables on a weekly basis, if you're scaffolding the, the, the assignments correctly or in a way that is more manageable for your workflow, um, there is a way in which students can turn in these relatively small um, parts of the particular assignment over the course of multiple weeks. So yeah, there is like this sort of concern that students are doing a lot over the course of multiple weeks, but they're not doing something that is very time consuming, but rather they're kind of like spreading out this work over the course of multiple weeks. Um, and you know, for things like Carmen quizzes, exactly Bonnie is mentioning things like uh, automatic rating, Carmen quizzes, et cetera. And we're gonna talk about some of the settings that you can employ in Carmen that also kind of reinforce uh, academic integrity. Yeah, grading is definitely a concern. Um, I think there you can use a lot of those 
grading things in Carmen quizzes um, and, and maybe instead of making the entire, if you have a high enrollment course, instead of making the entire exam authentic questions, add one or two. That may be more reasonable and still deter cheating, still give students a chance to show that critical thinking in a way that's hard to cheat on. Um, even if you can't redesign the entire assignment, is there one question or a few questions you could add throughout to check and give your students that chance to mm -hmm. show you their real learning? And to kind of jump on what Sarah was saying there, I would also recommend for those higher enrollment courses, uh, consider adding more questions that are application based rather than um, memorization based rather than, you know, rather than asking them, you know, even a multiple choice question can be application based and ask students to kind of apply what they've learned um, in a way that demonstrates what they've learned. Um, beyond just kind of like rote memorization. Mm -hmm. We'll talk at the end too about ways to follow up for your specific um, concerns in your class and definitely a consultation with the Drake Institute or OD consultants would be a great way to kind of really hash out what's the best way to handle your particular scenario there. So the second um, gear in Charles's integrated framework that he mentioned is prevention. So uh, maybe you've done some major redesign and you're still concerned and you want to learn how to work those settings in a way to maximize integrity for your students. Or maybe you can't change all of your assessments right now for various reasons. Um, we can still um, add some preventative measures into the assessments that you're using to make that um, bar for students meeting those expectations a little easier for them to, to cross. So the biggest thing, and this has come up with your own experiences in the chat already, is being really explicit about our expectations for what counts as integrity. Charles mentioned all kinds of students who are under pressures that we may not know about. Um, and also there's disciplinary dif differences. What counts as cheating in my course where I am requiring students to collaborate every week may be very different from another course where you want them to do their own writing every single time. And it, students don't come to us knowing, seeing those disciplinary differences um, intuitively. We can do a lot uh, to decrease misconduct, but just by explaining to them what we expect for every assignment particularly online where we have less informal opportunities to clarify that with them or to notice that there may be misunderstandings. Um, for, if you're, for those of you with large enrollment classes or who give um, exams where you, if you cannot change that kind of assessment, you can add an integrity question. Um, it's not as binding as some institutions where there may be a, a formal honor code, but the research is pretty clear that when we put this on students' mind, when we ask them to commit to our expectations of integrity, they are more likely to follow through. There is some um, commitment that when we, we put it front of mind before they begin their exam, that, that reminds them that they wanna be um, honest, that they wanna do their best and show their own work on these things. I'll show you some examples of what that looks like in a minute. Um, for those of you who are giving uh, quizzes and exams, you can also do multiple versions. This is probably the, um, in some ways, the easiest way for those of you who have those really large enrollment, especially GEs, um, is to have multiple versions. The old school in-person version was, you know, you'd give a blue paper and then a pink paper and a yellow paper and you'd alternate throughout the auditorium. But you can do that in Carmen by setting up quiz banks. Um, I'll show you some of those in a moment. And then within that, um, those quizzes and exams, you can also randomize questions so that students who may be um, considering working in the same space or communicating in a group chat or something are gonna be getting a different set of questions um, as they're taking those assessments. And that makes it much, much harder and prevents a lot of the integrity um, concerns that people have with those um, kinds of auto-graded Carmen quizzes and exams. We also want to set reasonable time limits and windows for completion. Um, a lot of times folks get um, kind of caught up on the idea of, um, you know, wanting to put online exams in the same time limit that you would need in person. Um, and I think that it's important to remember that we have all those connectivity issues, the access issues Charles was mentioning. Um, and so when we're thinking about online specific academic integrity, we may need to expand our view about what is reasonable as a time limit to complete assessments. So if this is something that they're going to be um, working on as a piece of writing and uploading, um, you know, that is something they're mostly doing offline or at least not in Carmen. And that may be reasonable to have the same, you know, you have three days to write this or you have a week um, to, to complete this writing. 
in that sort of take home exam style. But if you're having them do a multiple choice style quiz or exam in Carmen, they may need a little more time, not only to load any images or videos or diagrams that you're adding, but also to just interface. It takes a little bit longer for a lot of our students to type their thoughts than it does to handwrite or to um, load each question if they have lower speed internet, um, as well as a lot of social anxiety things that we're learning about um, in the pandemic about interacting with screens. Um, and so we want to maybe give a little bit more time or wider windows to make sure that they can go to a place with high speed internet to make sure that they're going to have, um, you know, a quiet distraction free uh, place to take those exams that maybe can't happen strictly between nine and 1030 the way it could if we were asking them to come to a classroom where we can control that environment a little more closely. So these are the main preventative strategies. I want to show you a few examples of what that looks like in in Carmen. So this example is that same course. Um, and so um, one of the things that um, Charles was mentioning is that portfolio um, that they used instead of um, a, an exam. And so this is an example of how you might set those expectations for what counts as academic integrity in your class in these online spaces. So this is an assignment in Carmen. This is using the ODEE uh, Carmen template and Queenie can share how to find that template for you in the chat if you have not used this before. You'll see that the directions are incredibly explicit. This may be um, more headers than you're used to explaining in a, in a typical assignment. Um, and you could include so much more here if as needed to really clarify what should be included, what are the directions, let them know how to succeed so they have that efficacy and believe that they can do well on their own merits. Um, you can also provide the resources that they might need. So someone was mentioning in the chat, what are the technical considerations? How do I use this app? I, how do I get good internet? How, what do I need to, what are the tech things I need to do this assignment well? So we can lower that barrier and make it easy for them to do this um, with integrity by putting those resources right here in the assignment. And then finally, including an academic integrity statement where we are really explicit about what is allowed and what is not allowed. This comes with, if you use that OD template, um, some standard is allowed, is not allowed language, but of course you can personalize this. So are they allowed to get help? And if they are allowed to get help, you could clarify, is that only help from you? Should they get help in the discussion boards on the project? Should they go to peers or you know community members? Um, are they allowed to collaborate? Are they expected, permitted and encouraged to collaborate? Or is this strictly do your own work? Um, are they allowed to copy or reuse work? This is something that can be really hard for um, our upper level students that are maybe building on um, projects across semesters or are revisiting ideas they've done in the past. So just making this really clear that they cannot copy their own work or if they've done something in a group, you want them to do something very different and independent when they turn in their solo project. Um, and then finally, open book. Should they be using resources? This is a question we get all the time. Um, a lot of times our strongest suggestion is wherever possible, when you can make these kinds of assessments open book, um, that will really decrease your threshold of misconduct. Um, students who have never looked at the book are unlikely to be able to succeed on an exam that's open book and timed. Even if they are looking at it for the first time, it's usually impossible to flip through and read something for the first time and do well on a timed open book assignment. So that's something you might consider if you have those large enrollment exams um, that will really decrease their willingness to take the risk of, of more explicitly cheating. So those are some of our integrity statements. Let me go back and show you a few other settings that we know prevent are preventative for misconduct. Um, this one is a quiz. I think this is where we have. Okay, so you can see here, this is an example of a, um, an integrity statement. So you might start your final exam or quiz or some other kind of assignment with this kind of a statement. So this is the very first question that they see and it really puts that academic integrity front of mind for them and lets them know what your expectations are and they're committing to following your expectations. So the work on this exam is my own. I pledge not to use outside source or get help. By clicking true, I pledge I will not work with others. You can make this true false. 
Um, that way you don't have to go in and grade it specifically for each student. Um, or if you have a smaller number of students where you are going to be hand grading it, you might have them type out their name as a short answer, something like that to help them commit. And then for those of you who said I, I suspected something, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to follow up, this gives you that, um, that clear expectation that they have said that they will not get help. They have pledged not to use outside help or to, to, do, to copy others' work. So that if you do need to follow through, um, you, know, you have that documented and you've made it really clear that there was an understanding standing in place. The last thing I want to show you um, that's a preventative measure um, example here is the way that we have some of these quizzes set up. And make sure I get the right one. I think it's this one. So for this quiz, um, nope, that's that same one. <laughs> okay, I'll show you um, in the editing thing. So in this one we have, um, in a quiz, you can set it up as you're adding questions to swap out um, different questions, which makes it more like a randomized set. Um, different students will get different sets of questions if you use these question banks, which reduces their ability to copy off of each other or share answers. Um, so one way to do that is to set up question banks. And then when you build the, qu the quiz itself, you can see here that you have sort of a question bank for week one questions and then a question bank for week two questions. So in this particular course, in week one, they take a quiz, there's 10 questions, they are all week one questions. In week two, they're given seven questions from week two and three questions from week one. And those are randomly pulled from that original set. So some, those, some of those might be review or some of them might be new, um, but now they're getting a random assortment of week one and two questions. This goes on through this particular course so that in week three, they're getting mostly week three questions, but with a few week two and a few week one, and that's all randomized. That not only helps with reducing misconduct, but it's also called, um, interleaving so that students have to revisit and can't just cram and memorize something for one quiz and then dump it and never remember again, which starts to incentivize very quickly they realize there's no point in cheating in week two because you're still going to need to use that in week three or week four and it no longer becomes worth the risk of not knowing you can't just dump that information which reduces the um, payoff for doing um, any kind of cheating or answer sharing. There are lots of ways to set up those question banks. It is a little fussy in Carmen to describe it verbally. It's a much more visual thing. So if that's something that you're interested in setting up, I would encourage you to um, work with someone at OD um, or to watch some of our um, resources about setting up quizzes. We have some articles in the Teaching and Learning Resource Center um, specifically about that that can walk you through how to set it up. One. Other consideration that I want to acknowledge about that for those of you who have talked about time and your own prep being a consideration is that this is, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, a heavy investment of your time in writing extra quiz questions or setting things up in Carmen. I will say that if misconduct is a concern for you, this is one of the better investments in your time that you can make. If you, if you don't, aren't able to redesign and build an authentic assignment and commit to being able to grade that every semester, the second best thing would be to build these robust quiz uh, question banks and to randomize your quiz questions. Um, if you have TAs or an instructional team that can help you with that, if you are um, one of many people teaching these sections, get everybody together for a Zoom coffee break and just write questions or ask your students to write questions as part of their exam review and then you can pull some of theirs. Um, and then the, another thing we say all the time is you may not be able to make this perfect your first semester, but if you could set up those question banks and write 10 questions this semester, next semester you can add two or three and very quickly you'll build a very robust question bank that you can randomize very easily. What questions do you have about these preventative measures? Is there anything that we haven't answered in the chat or things that you would still like to ask? Um, Sarah, uh, Frederick has a question in chat about um, time limits for, for different types of quizzes. Sure. Um, in that example, that is just one that we made up to be able to show you something 
that didn't already have real disciplinary stuff in it. So I probably would rarely give 180 minutes for an 11 point quiz. If it was a weekly practice quiz with like only a few points where you really just wanted them to do their best and think through, and you weren't interested in testing that recall um, very quickly, that could be fine. There's no set you know, suggestion for the number of minutes. But I think what you would wanna, uh, if you've taught this course in person before is think about how much time do they need in person and then adding a good window. So if you had a 90 minute exam in the past, for example, your students may need a two hour window to be reasonable when you're adding all of the tech interface delays and that extra processing time. And um, when we talk about time limits for actually starting the quiz and finishing it versus the window that they may be available to take it. Um, those are sort of two different ways of thinking about time as well. So unfortunately, the answer to your question, Frederick, is it depends. Okay, if you keep having more questions, keep putting them in the chat, we'll keep answering them there. We're gonna put you back into your breakout rooms and thinking about those two um, parts of the framework that we've discussed, so redesign and prevention. Um, come back with your group and think about what is one strategy that you are already doing really well. I'm sure that some of these things are not surprising to you. We've seen in the chat, a lot of you are already using parts of these strategies. So what's something you're already doing well help your um, peers understand. So maybe they might want to know that it, it does in fact work with your students. Um, and then also pick one that you want to try. What's something aspirational that you could do next semester to, to increase your efficiency here? Okay, so hopefully you found that helpful to share some of the strategies you're using or want to use. Um, if you can, just in the chat, go ahead and tell us um, something that you learned or thought was interesting from sharing with your peers here. Um, this doesn't have to be something that's going great, but just something that you found interesting from that conversation that maybe sparked your curiosity or is giving you an idea for a way to move forward with this. And Christina, we did see your, your question right before we went to the breakout rooms. Emma's going to answer it there for you in the chat. Yeah, so that academic integrity pledge, it's such a small thing. It's something we can all add even to our finals this semester. Um, and we, the research is pretty clear that it does make a difference in reminding students about those expectations and, and sort of mustering up their best selves, helps them make good choices as they go. Anything else that came up for you in those groups? Yeah, additional time. It's, uh, you know, that stress of the pandemic is making everything feel more urgent right now. And, and I think it's really important to, to go back to those core relationships. Charles was, ta Charles was talking about that, you know, rather than locking down even further as we are putting these assessments online, we may actually need to give more time to reduce cheating. It's a little counterintuitive, but when students feel like they have time to do their best work and to concentrate, and when we reduce that stress, we actually see the cheating come down. So that one's a, a kind of a counterintuitive thing, but I'm glad that that um, was resonating with people. Mm -hmm. Being Whenever you can have those fill in the blanks, if they have to do their own writing, that's gonna be preventative. Not always possible if you're under a time crunch for your own workload, but um, definitely a good preventative strategy. Um, and so Frederick was asking is, can you adjust those time limits on Carmen? And yes, yes, you can. Um, you can adjust that for individual students and you can also set it, um, set it up to um, offer extra time as needed. Okay, so we've talked about redesign and we've talked about prevention, um, but we do wanna give a little bit of time to ways to use the tool for, de for detection um, and also just to help you understand what tools Ohio State supports and, and how to use them. If you're going to use them, how to use them effectively and humanely. So Emma's gonna um, share with us about detection. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so this, this slide is um, just gonna kind of talk about um, some considerations to take into account for the detection uh, part of the 
overall strategy. Um, you you want to think about tools as your your first option. You know, as your first option, you want to keep it in mind, but you want to think about the redesign and the other elements first. Um, as as hopefully everyone here has is familiar with Carmen, but you may have, it's not perfect. Um, no one tool is perfect and they're all going to have um, different quirks that, that may make them better for some purposes and, and not so good in all situations. And generally there is a way to think about using a tool um, a pinch is good. You don't necessarily want to have, say, Proctorial enabled for every quiz. You might want to have it on the the more the, the final quiz, maybe or a midterm, but not necessarily every single quiz. And to thinking of in general technology, um, your students may have used Proctorial before, but they may not have. So what we highly recommend. Uh, been mentioned during this workshop is just setting up a practice quiz um, to actually a zero extra credit practice quiz that allows students to run through using Proctorio and see if they're going to run into any issues. Um, I believe Queenie has been sharing um, some links in the uh, in the chat about that. So if you'd like to move on to the next slide. So when you, when we think about using uh, Proctorio, it's it's linked to Chrome. That's the currently the only browser that it works with. Um, it may require, depending on the settings you choose, it may require the microphone and the webcam. Something to bear in mind is that not all will have access to a laptop that will have those working components. It's, it's just generally good to think about um, when you're working with technology, it's your students may not be familiar with what it is and why you're using it. So it's always good to situate the use of technology and why you're doing it, why academic integrity is important, what it will actually do and what it won't do. So it Proctorio allows the instructor to review data and to see what um, behavior has been flagged, but it will never categorically say that one student has been cheating. It just um, allows the instructor to see which submissions may require uh, more attention. And as I mentioned before, having a zero point practice quiz is really good not only from the point of view of the student who can have a chance to go through it in a sort of low or low um, without much stakes but actually allows you the instructor to practice get familiar with what that looks like from from your side because in the nature of Proctorio um, you may as students have the option to request uh, alternative proctoring uh, options and that's generally what you want to have covered in the syllabus. Uh, I think Queenie has already shared of the proctorial links but basically getting started with proctorial covers syllabus language and what you want to take into account when you're starting this proctorial. There are some special limitations uh, with Proctor uses, um, it uses an algorithm to basically flag what it terms suspicious behavior. Um, folks may not realize that AI is basically uh, trained on white people. So that means that sometimes it may not be as effective when um, students are people of color. And obviously that's important to keep to keep in mind and is something you may want to, to think about before using it. Okay. When it comes to turn it in, if generally Proctorio is going to be used for quizzes, 
but um, some of you have mentioned papers or um, basically what Turnitin does compare the student's uploaded paper to a database and flags things like um, direct if the student has copied and pasted from a website, it will flag that and things like that. It, similar to Proctorio, it produces a report um, that has a percentage. The higher the percentage, the more content has been taken from other sources. Um, we, we've been talking about scaffolding throughout this whole workshop. So a good uh, use of Turnitin could be something like the students can submit um, drafts just through the user assignment feature with uh, Carmen. And then for the final draft, the, the draft that is then graded, they can use Turnitin. It's it's a good way, uh, the previous workshop of this we gave, uh, Missy Beers was here and mentioned that it can be a good way to highlight if a student is over relying on original sources if they aren't breaking that down enough, if they're just quoting original sources without much um, interpretation. So it can be a way to say, this is what a well-written paper looks like. It's not that, it's not necessarily designed with that punitive approach in mind. It's more uh, guidance and scaffolding. And again, just with Proctorio, you want to include the expectations and the throughout the throughout the course, laying down what you're going to use. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Queenie has shared the the template that um, Sarah mentioned. There is um, a practice quiz that's set up with Proctorio that we'd recommend you um, access. At if it can be worth getting together with your colleagues and actually having them enroll you in a course as a student. So you can actually take a quiz as a student would and setting up with the settings you wanna have will give you that experience. So when they say this feels weird or it feels like I'm being spied on, you can say, well, I have done it. And yes, it's, it's not necessarily typical, but this is why I'm doing it and I have done it. So I understand how you're feeling. So uh, Emma has shared about those two main um, tools that Ohio State supports, so Proctorio and Turnitin. And I know that we get a lot of questions about these in general. So what questions do you folks have about these tools or others that you've heard about, others that you're using or thinking about? Emma is a tool master, so she's ready to share answers. Shadrach is interested in hearing more about the AI bias. Mm -hmm. So um, I um, don't have any uh, stats right at hand, but this is something that's a, a widespread uh, thing. If you've ever seen news about um, folks going through any kind of automatic recognition programs, you know, airport security, things like that, they're not, they're basically, um, and a lot of technology is, is uses white people. They, they use white people as the sample base and don't necessarily expand that. It, the, the program does not have the same experience recognizing non-white faces. I think big picture, what we know about that is that then we tend to see a lot of false positives on students of color. Um, and over time, that starts to make them feel more self-conscious, more stressed. And so again, counterintuitively, this thing that was designed to reduce cheating may actually increase stress and students may feel like, well, what's the point of doing my best if you're just gonna assume I'm cheating anyway, I might as well cheat. Um, or 
to have that barrier of I'm not going to be able to do my best even when I'm doing honest work and it's going to reduce their performance ability because we've added this whole layer of racial disparity and racial stress um, because of that tool. So a lot of these things that that seem like simple fixes for cheating can often exacerbate that problem of either increasing misconduct or reducing student performance because we're adding this burden of stress and a barrier to their learning. I would also add that um... Proctorio can also trigger things with students who are in uh, non-traditional circumstances. You know, most Proctorio, uh, Proctorio will often uh, trigger noise and things like that. So people with, uh, who are living with family or with children or who are in circumstances where they're having to take the exam in a noisy setting are going to be automatically penalized differently than students who have the sort of privilege of uh, finding a nice quiet place in which they can take their exam. So again, it's one of those considerations where we typically don't think about uh, bias, but it can obviously crop up in strange little places like that. Yeah, to, um, to speak to uh, Charles's point, as well as uh, what Bonnie's mentioning in chat, is uh, one of the things that Portorio does is um, uh, compare students to, to everyone taking the quiz and things like um, movement, which which isn't about ad identity per se, but it looks for the face and things like that um, is impacted by that. So it's not necessarily um, a, a setting that you uh, can require identification. Proctorio isn't scanning that ID and comparing it with a Buckeye D. It doesn't, it, there's not that interface, but just in general, because it's trained on and AI in general is trained on white faces, that that's that leads to to various issues. Particularly, we you know like with eye shape, if it's looking for whether you're where you're looking on the monitor or looking away, potentially, you know, ideally it would be catching students who are looking away to read answers when they're not allowed to use other texts. But because that is based on eye shape and pupil, all these kinds of mathematical ratios, when those ratios are programmed for white faces and common white ratios, then when you add other kinds of eye shape or mouth shape or facial proportions, it's going to give you a lot of flags, even for students who are looking in the place where they're supposed to look because it's not really reading their actual eyes in the same way as uh, folks with a more average white phenotype. Mm -hmm. and, and something to, to also bring up other factors, things like access to like Charles was in quiet spaces, um, it is going to be a factor, especially with the pandemic. So um, that's just something um, if students have had to go back home again, um, they may have to share a room, they may um, to have roommates in the, in the room with them. It's, it's not always easy to get that uh, time away from, uh, from other people. <laughs> Frederick mentioned that too, and, and some of the other concerns here in the chat. Um, Proctorio is not really accessible for our students with disability accommodations. The accommodation is usually just don't use it, take it without that, um, that um, filter on there. Um, and also that it's not, um, you cannot access it from all devices. So um, Emma was mentioning, you know, it needs to have Chrome. Um, so some of our students that are maybe not on campus and don't have access to the devices, we might commonly um, expect them to have are not able to do this at home during the pandemic and are going to places putting themselves at higher COVID risk to be able to take these things um, for on Proctorio. Uh, right. And I was mentioned just now that, you know, tablets and iPads and stuff like that, Proctorio will not work. Mm -hmm. 100%. And um, obviously, um, not everyone has a laptop that has a web camera that works. Um, uh, lockdown browser um, as an option that's still available but um, the issue with that is that um, it does not although it locks down their browser it does not because it doesn't monitor the student in the same way that Proctorio does it wouldn't be able to tell if um, a student has another device right next to them that they're using to cheat so it's it was really designed for um, still a face-to-face -face or uh, a lab, a testing lab set up really rather than a purely online situation. 
We are hearing a lot of our students who get stuck with lockdown browsers too, if they have intermittent internet. Um, I'm sure you've heard even just during this presentation, you know, like, you know, it's, it's just hard to have a sustained long period of time, even if you have pretty stable internet. And when you have that lockdown browser out, if your internet goes out, even for a few seconds, it can freeze the entire thing and students get locked out or it auto submits their quiz or they run out of time. It makes it very, very difficult when they're working at home on low speed internets, or again, if they have to drive to the library or they're sitting in a parking lot or trying to take this in unusual places, um, lockdown browser makes that access issue very, very difficult for our students. Um, and again, as Emma was saying, because they can just open their smartphone, um, they really have a workaround to the thing it was designed to prevent. So you're really just adding barriers without getting any substantive um, misconduct uh, detection. So I, I, we've kind of talked about the reasons perhaps not to, to use Proctorio or at least not to rely on it, but there is, I'm um, talking about internet access. Um, if students have concerns, the one really useful thing I think it does is it does tell you if students lost internet connectivity during a test. So, I mean, I am pretty sure everyone here has had a student say I lost internet when I was taking quiz. And before there wasn't a great way to just confirm that with Proctorio there is. So again, a lot of this comes down to how you're framing it and how you talk about it with them. I think there's a big difference for students when we say, um, we're gonna use Proctorio, here's my reasons. Um, I've tried this, I understand, here's what you might expect to be stressful or feel weird because you've experienced it yourself. And when you can share that and, and help them know what to expect and then say, one of the things I like about it is that it really lets me know that if your internet gets disconnected, I will be able to reinstate the quiz for you. It lets me help you when these things happen. So if you do have to use it, just think about how you're explaining it and that framing can go a long way to reducing their stress. And that really is the key to all of these tools is that when you use them, try to use them in ways that reduces stress and help students understand why and how to succeed with them. And I would also recommend in the spirit of that kind of introducing Proctorio as a tool that will be used throughout the entire semester. First of all, share whatever resources you can, especially student facing resources um, about Proctorio, how to install it, how to use it just give students the basic information they need to make sure that they can succeed with the tool. And I would also recommend creating like a very short, simple sample quiz with Proctorio so students are familiar with the interface before they have to take those higher stakes exams. So maybe just like a very simple two or three question uh, quiz or exam um, maybe it doesn't even it is, isn't even worth that many points within the grand scheme of things, but just something very simple that students can kind of take in order to familiarize themselves with what it's like taking an exam using Proctorio. So hopefully the theme that you're taking away, um, Emma, Charles, and I are all really passionate about this. The most important thing you can do to reduce misconduct is to focus on that relationship between yourself and your students, um, giving them opportunities to practice, being explicit about your expectations, uh, framing it for them, explaining it, um, using things consistently and with a good reason rather than just, oh, I should add this. If you have a good reason and you explain it, that's gonna go a long way for them reducing their stress and understanding what you need them to do. Um, the assumptions that students have about misconduct and what counts as cheating can be a real barrier to them for asking for help. And so, uh, although it can feel a little bit like it's, uh, you know, all our job, um, it is uh, really helpful when we are proactive about making places for them to ask for help, which those low stakes recognize when students are struggling early in a project instead of when it's too late and it's worth 300 points, um, or if giving them those chances to practice with these tools. Um, and then also that rationale. Um, all of these tools are useful for something. Um, are they useful for the thing you are trying to prevent or trying to accomplish with your class is another question. So if you're gonna use a tool, have a good reason for doing so and be able to explain that to your students um, so they know um, why these restrictions are in place and how you are using them. So we have a few minutes. Um, we'd like you to reflect 
on what you've learned today and what you might need to learn next. So what things are you able to change in the course? You are probably not able to change everything. That might be because you're teaching right now and finals are in a few weeks and you simply cannot completely change what you've led the students to expect. It may be that you're teaching next semester and you have a thousand plus students and there are just some things that logistically cannot be accommodated with a high enrollment course or on this short of notice. Um, or for your own workload. You're human beings who deserve manageable workloads. So we're, we would not ever advocate that you add something that is going to add um, unfathomable amounts of stress to your grading life. But knowing what you are able to change and what you are not, and then focusing on those things you can change, try to pick one assignment that you have some control over. What steps do you need to take to either prevent or to detect cheating? Um, to ensure the integrity of that assignment. So take some, some maybe two minutes here to reflect. Um, if you want to share in the chat, I know that um, your peers are getting a lot out of your ideas, or you can just keep this um, to yourself as your action plan moving forward. So yeah, some specific things coming in the chat. If you're feeling stuck for ideas, look in there. Um, Christina's adding some very manageable ways to increase the randomization in the quizzes without too much time. Emily's talking about just framing things differently so students understand why she's using Turnitin um, and clarifying what's important about your own words. What's Why do we care about copying and pasting? A small conversation can not just prevent cheating on your assignments, but also really um, be a formative learning experience for them when they start to understand why this is a disciplinary norm for us, right? Those question banks for quizzes, great. So as you're reflecting and you're identifying these places you would like to make changes and what those steps might be, um, we would encourage you to use the resources at Ohio State. You don't have to figure this all out on your own. Once you've identified some places you wanna make adjustments, you have resources available to you. So one place to um, get some help for those next steps is a consultation with Odie. Um, there's that website right there. Um, this is an opportunity to work with an ed tech or an instructional designer. Um, this is a good place to come when you kind of know what you wanna do, but maybe you want some support on setting up those qu uh, question banks. If you've never done randomized questions for your quizzes or interleaving. If you want to use Proctorio and, and play with the settings or understand how to set up a practice Proctorio quiz for your student, OD is a great place to come for those kinds of consultations. If you have tech questions that are very specific, how do I hide my files? Um, I think Christina was asking earlier so that students can't see the images and the quizzes ahead of time. You can email carmen at osu.edu, uh, get some tech help with those really specific issues. If something's not working right for you or your students, this is also the best place to go to get that kind of um, IT support. If you have a question about how to write different kinds of questions or how to develop an authentic assignment for your class, if you're going to do some deep redesign work or you're curious about how to redistribute those points, you might want to uh, might want to contact the Drake Institute and work with one of their consultants about some of those pedagogical issues uh, before you're even ready to put it into Carmen, right? We also have articles. Queenie's been sharing a ton of great relevant resources in the chat all along. So remember to um, download the chat using those three buttons, the ellipsis button um, there if you want to capture those links. But if you want to come back to those another time, our teaching resources.osu.edu um, is a great place to search for articles, um, how to kinds of um, tutorials and other information about the teaching strategies and tools we discussed today. Um, and then finally, for anything up to date information 
information about um, our recommendations, guidance, ideas, and policies around um, the pandemic-related um, issues. Keepteaching.osu.edu slash get help is a great place to see upcoming uh, workshops, watch the recordings of this or other uh, related workshops, um, or to, to see what is happening with pandemic specific access and student strategies. And with that, we will say thank you. Um, please give us some feedback on how this went. Uh, Queenie shared that evaluation form in the chat. Um, and we will hang around for a few minutes. If you have more questions, we would love to help you think through some of your challenges um, and successes with student misconduct or academic integrity. So thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your Monday.